On October 6, 2016, Rasho Christie was privileged to host Dr. Micah Green, Associate Professor of Chemical Engineering here at Texas A&M. From Bill Nye to Bill O'Reilly, the perennial debate between science and religious belief is plagued by shallow thinking and, frankly, really bad argumentation. In this lecture, Dr. Green surveys some of the most egregious errors that stem from a poor understanding from both sides of the divide. Dr. Green argues that this conflict is much deeper than science versus Jesus and, when properly categorized, is more of a discussion on the merits of naturalism versus theism. And now, here's the talk. discuss and, and even disagree um, with an attitude of, of respect and kindness toward one, one another. Um, sometimes for students in college, they think like, oh, it's no fun to see people, you know, disagree. And so they try to minimize the disagreements and say, oh, all, every, all faith systems are basically the same. We don't, well, there's no actual disagreements. And I, I think probably the, the bigger danger as opposed to people disagreeing with each other. The biggest danger for college students is to go through their entire college career and they never talk about anything that's really important. They talk about you know, their studies and their grades and they talk about sports and it's nothing that's really <coughs> eternal, nothing that really matters. Um, and so that would be the great tragedy if a student goes through and they never talk about those important things. And so the fact that you're here, the fact that we're talking about this, I think will provide one of those opportunities for us to talk about some, some topics that really matter. And um, I want to make sure you understand I'm not coming at this from the perspective of, uh, of uh, the expert who has all the answers and, and is going to tell you how to think. Um, I think my bigger goal is to give a, a framework tonight for how to talk about science and faith and do so in a respectful way. And so if you come from a different faith background than me, um, I, I'm, I'm really glad you're here, and I'm glad that we can have this opportunity to discuss. So um, I changed the, the – uh, Zach um, gave a couple different <coughs> flyers out there, and one of them he put Beaker in, and so I thought that, might, that one might be, might be the better one to start us off with. So um, I want you to quickly think about some of the, the ways you've been told that, that science – and faith, in particular Christianity, are in conflict. Just to give you kind of a roadmap of what we're going to do, I'm going to cover three different pieces. One about specific, specific disagreements, um, then talk about big picture disagreements, and then I'll end with kind of my own faith story, and I'll, I'll, I'll um, try to make sure we have time at the end for questions, okay? So if you think about um, disagreements... Uh, usually they, co they come in one of two forms. Usually it's very specific things like, oh, the Bible says this, but science says that. And there are actually these very specific disagreements. I'm going to try to cover that very broadly and give you a framework for how to think through that initially. But I think the, the far more important uh, uh, issues when it comes to science and faith are, are put at a, at a much broader level. And even framing it as science and faith is already part of the problem. So I'll spend the bulk of my time there. So I want you to have these two categories in your mind. We can have conflict on specific claims of Christianity, or you can have big picture conflicts. And an example of a big picture conflict would be a claim like, well, miracles are impossible scientifically, so therefore Christianity must be false. That would be a big picture claim. So we'll, we'll try to get to both of those. Okay. Uh, when I say specific points of, of conflict, usually when people argue about the Bible and science, it's usually on, on very specific details in the Bible. How you know, how old is the earth? Tell me about Adam and Eve. Tell me about Jonah. Is it really possible for Jonah to be swallowed by a whale and actually survive it? Those little detailed questions, right? And you can get lost in the details. And so what I want to try to do is give you a framework for how Christians can, can respectfully disagree with each other on these points um, without necessarily villainizing the other, okay? So Christians come at these kind of questions saying, um, generally, uh, uh, saying we have a commitment to um, God's revelation through the Bible and we have a commitment to the scientific data, right? God's not going to put the scientific data out there to trick us. So both of those things are going to be legitimate. And most of the time, there's not really a problem. The, the, the biblical data and the scientific data don't seem to be at odds. Uh, but there may be occasions where um, you read the Bible, you read a specific story, and at first glance it leads you to a particular conclusion. Um, and then when you look at the scientific data, it may lead you to another uh, uh, conclusion, Okay, And so for Christians, I'm just giving you the framework that Christians use to work through this. They say, well, I've got a problem. Okay, The biblical data, as I interpret it, leads me to a particular conclusion. And the scientific data seems to lead me to another conclusion. That may, be, that may apply to problems of history, archaeology, science, you name it. So what I want to focus on here is the fact that for a Christian, because they're committed to both the biblical data and the scientific data, if they see this pattern begin to emerge... They don't throw out either set of data. Does that make sense? 
They're saying if we end up with two different conclusions, then the problem must be somewhere else. Where's the problem? On the interpretation. Maybe, so, so here's what you'll see. Um, <clears throat> in many cases, we, we say, like, maybe we were interpreting the Bible correctly. And some of y'all have heard of these stories where people interpreted the Bible to mean certain things about the geography of the world or, you know, the, the solar system or whatever back in medieval times. And so when the scientific data confronts them, they think... Maybe I need to go back to the Bible and, and think through my interpretation. Maybe I was interpreting the Bible to, to mean conclusion one when it really wasn't warranted. Okay? So Christian A, in this case, is saying, I have a conflict. I'm going to try to reinterpret the Bible and say maybe I, I was wrong when I came to the Bible. Okay? Um, the other possibility is, is uh, someone may say, hey, maybe we're, re- we're interpreting the scientific, scientific data uh, incorrectly, and we need to reinterpret that, and then I'll be able to get these two to come together. Right? This is often considered the more fundamentalist thing to do, right? to, to reinterpret the scientific data to drive more at, a, at, at the conclusion that you would think comes from the biblical data. Okay? And so these two sides tend to villainize each other. Right? They tend to yell at each other and say, how dare you, you know, you're, 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 um, you're trying to squish the Bible into man's opinion, blah, blah, blah. And so if, you're, if, if some of y'all came to hear about uh, creation evolution type debates or anything like that, um, this is about as close as I'm going to get. I'd say when Christians disagree on these things, they may go either way. But the, the, the point I would want to emphasize is instead of villainizing each other and yelling at each other, Christians A and B, who take those two approaches, in reality actually are on the same side because they're both committed to the biblical data and the, script and the, and the scientific data. Let me be clear about what I mean. When I say the biblical data, I mean the text. They say, the Bible is God's word, I'm committed to this, but it is possible that I can misinterpret it, right? And if somebody disagrees with your interpretation, that does not mean they're defying God. That means they disagree with your interpretation, and that's all. And we have to have respect for one another and recognize the fact that it is possible for us to misinterpret the Bible. It is possible for us to misinterpret science. And as these two Christians disagree with each other on how they're going to resolve a particular uh, discrepancy, a seeming discrepancy or seeming difficulty, they need to do that in a way that, that honors the other side. Does that make sense? I'll, I'll just be real honest with you. I grew up in a, in a household where um, it was very much the, the B side, and um, there was a lot of, of villainizing of, of anybody who would take the A approach, the idea of reinterpreting the Bible in light of, of what came from science. And what I've realized is that that... that um, that disagreement or that disrespect doesn't have to be there. Christians really can take either approach and recognize that they're, they're, they're kind of on the same side and they don't have to, to, to villainize one another. And if you're a non-believer, you may be thinking, like, maybe the Bible and the science just flat out disagree with each other. How about that? And so you actually have to do your homework on whatever specific issue and see if that's the case. Um, and so if you run into an apparent conflict, uh, here's my advice. And, and this, I'm, I'm mainly thinking of, like, the the Christians in the audience who are freshmen and they're kind of scared, right? You just arrived here on campus a couple months ago and you feel dumb and maybe you have a professor who thinks that all Christians are stupid um, and you run into some specific conflict and you're kind of scared to even approach the topic. My advice to you is, in, in those cases, approach the difficulty from a standpoint of, of uh, confidence rather than fear. Um, I had an experience when I was fairly young. I was probably seven or eight years old, and I ran into um, uh, what seemed to be a discrepancy in the Bible, right? One gospel told a particular story one way, and another gospel seemed to tell a story another way. And I showed it to someone in my church, and I said, well, what do you think? These, these two things don't seem to agree. And the person basically told me to, like, buzz off, like, hush, you know. And, uh, but my father actually saw this whole interaction. And uh, I can remember very distinctly. So my dad took me aside and he looked me right in the eyes and he said, you can ask any question you want. And so I guess that's what I want to tell you is you can ask any question you want. You don't have to approach these kind of things from a position of fear, of thinking like, oh my God, goodness, if I, if, I, if I ask the wrong question, then my entire faith system will be undermined. Um, you can ask with confidence. The reality is when Christians run into some issue, and I'll give you a couple of examples, if Christians run into some issue where they say, whoa, I, I don't know what the Bible's really saying here, basically because of our prior information, our prior um, uh, reasons for trusting in Jesus, believing in the Bible as God's word, we can say, I trust the Bible based on this prior trustworthy track record, and I'm going to have that trust there while I try to work out this discrepancy, rather than fearing that my entire faith system is on the bubble and approaching it from, from a position of fear. I'll give you an example. In case Some of y'all may be like, I don't know what you're talking about. So I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, if you read 
uh, the the um, the different gospels. They tell the different stories of uh, of Jesus. They tell the stories out of order, right? One gospel will tell them in one order, and another gospel will tell them in another order. That seems to be a contradiction, right? And so, from an archaeological historical standpoint, you could say, well, I guess the Bible's wrong, and there's no resolving this difficulty. But the reality is, you start digging into it, and you find out that ancient bio- biography, like what Luke was trying to write when he wrote the Gospel of Luke, writing things in chronological order actually was not a big concern. And if you could talk to the writer of the Gospel of Luke and said, hey, you told your, you, you told your story out of order, he would be like, who cares? What's your, your, that's not the genre of my, of my book. You're missing the point. And so that would be an example of realizing that you need to reinterpret the Bible to, according to the genre that it actually is coming from, and it removes the difficulty. Does that make sense? And you can approach that from a, from a standpoint of confidence and not one of, uh, of fear and, and, uh, and you know, trembling, so to speak. Okay. I know that I didn't get into all the details on creation, evolution, blah, 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 and I'm, I'm not going to either. Uh, but this gives you a framework for how to talk to others about how to address these kind of issues. Okay, moving on. Now, the main point of my talk tonight, and this is, this is uh, here I can be a, a little more confident, is what is the conflict? Is it science against faith? Is it science versus Christianity? What I want to try to emphasize to you is that it is not so much science which is opposed to Christianity. It is the word, it is scientism. Scientism is a somewhat pejorative term, but I'm going to use it anyway. Scientism is a particular belief system about how we know. How do we know what we know? And scientism says that scientific testing is the only path to reliable knowledge. And you can imagine why someone would, would think that. Um, the only thing we can get anybody in the whole world to, to agree on are things that come from science, right? People disagree on everything. They disagree on politics. They disagree on economics. But we can get everyone to kind of agree on the principles of uh, heat transfer because the air conditioner works, right? So, therefore, we say, all right, everybody agrees on science? Okay, good. Science is a good place for us to get knowledge because then at least we can all agree, and it's fairly objective, okay? So science is a good source of truth. So scientism, scientism says not only is science a good source for truth, it is the only source of truth because it's the only way you can get this object, uh, objective knowledge that everybody can actually agree on, okay? And because science only deals with the natural world, the natural world is the only thing you can really know anything about. So the belief that the natural world is all that exists, we call that naturalism, okay? So naturalism says... The natural world is all that exists. Scientism says the natural world is all you can know about. And so if someone believes in this this philosophy of scientism, they may say, you can believe in God, you can believe in Jesus, you can believe whatever you want, but but that's not knowledge. That's a preference. It's a belief, but it's not grounded in anything objective. That's the philosophy of scientism. Do you all understand this concept? You can see why this would be opposed to Christianity, because it basically says... uh, this person's a Muslim and that person's a Christian, it's roughly the same as saying this person likes one flavor of ice cream and that person likes another. Because you can't adjudicate the difference between the two on the basis of science, so therefore it's just taste, so to speak. Right? It's not actually knowledge. We wouldn't say one person is wrong for liking one flavor versus another. In the same way you would say this religious knowledge is is not actually knowledge. So that's where the scientism comes in. Does this make sense? And you can see why people would be drawn to this. It's because um, science provides us with, with good knowledge. So <clears throat> uh, if you watch the TV show Cosmos, did anyone watch Cosmos? A very well done show. Uh, but this idea of scientism is like virtually, um, it shows up every five minutes, the idea. We know this through science, therefore it's legitimate. All other avenues of inquiry, no good. Um, and so this is what I want to push back on a little bit. Um, this idea of scientism actually goes back a long way. It has a couple of different variations. You may have heard of it as empiricism or positivism, maybe 100 years ago. A positivist would, would say um, only scientifically testable statements even have any meaning. Everything else, it doesn't even have a meaning. Okay? But it really it goes back to David Hume uh, back in the 1700s. And he's, he's kind of the one who, who, I guess, would say popularized it and first formulated it. But I want you to think through this statement. Only beliefs that can be proven through scientific experiments are trustworthy. Imagine you said this to your friend, okay? You say, only beliefs that, are proven through sci- that can be proven through scientific experiments are trustworthy. But then the question comes back, can you prove that statement through scientific experiments? And you say, oh, I can't. Oh, crud, my rule fails itself. I have a rule that I can only know things through science, but I can't get the rule from science. And this is the point where David Hume said, huh, I guess that doesn't really work. So scientism, as a rule, is self-refuting. It is a philosophy that doesn't itself come from science. 
And so it's very hard to hold to. People still do it, but in the philosophical community, people are like, you know, it's kind of hard to hold to a rule that doesn't pass its own test. Do you all see what I mean? This is a major problem. Um, and so when you when you see when people say oh science that totally goes against Christianity it goes against any idea of the supernatural um, they may be confusing their ideas basically what they're saying is science is the only way to know something which doesn't work and um, and and so scientism assumes that anything outside that realm of science is unknowable so that's not something that's proved that's something that's really assumed and it's very hard to 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 um, to, to hold to that and you'll and what I would challenge you to do is look for this wherever it shows up. It shows up in all kinds of places. People will say this and use this as truth tests. They'll say, oh, if you can't prove it by science, if you can't give me evidence for it, then I'm not going to believe it. They're, when they say something like that, they are espousing scientism. You have to prove it to me by science, otherwise I can't know it. Oops, that statement, that rule can't be proven by science. Okay? Um, one place I saw it when I was an undergrad, I did my undergrad at Texas Tech. Guns up? No? Oh, no, okay. Anyway, I figured I wouldn't get a lot of... Oh, don't... Yeah, right back at you. Anyway. <laughs> The horses did not do that anyway. That's biologically inaccurate. Okay. Um, so a fellow honor student said to me, oh, well, you know, science has proven that our minds are purely physical uh, and there's no such thing as a soul. And I said, like, what are you talking about? How would science prove that? And also we talked about it, and basically what he meant was, well, we've looked using our material microscopes and we didn't find an immaterial soul. Oh, that doesn't work, does it? You used an immaterial microscope to look for an immaterial soul, and you were surprised that you didn't find anything? Um, so, so you see what the assumption he's making. Sci- if there were such a thing as a soul, science would be able to find it. That's a big assumption. And it doesn't really make, make any sense when the soul itself is defined as immaterial. Um, another similar big picture problem that you'll hear people bring up has to do with miracles. They'll say, science disproved miracles. A miracle is effectively defined as something that should be scientifically impossible. Um, now, sometimes this is kind of, the, people will approach this by saying, well, you know, maybe back in the days when the Bible was written, um, uh, people thought that these miracles were actually possible. Maybe back then they thought something like a virgin birth uh, would actually be able to happen. But now we have science and we know that such a thing is impossible. Um, if you hear someone say something like that, it's effectively chronological snobbery, right? Thinking that ancient people were foolish. The reality is they knew that virgin births were impossible. They knew it couldn't happen naturally. And so there's no information that we have necessarily that, that, that gives us any advantage over them in regard to miracles. So <clears throat> what, what someone believed back then when they say a miracle has occurred, if you tell them it's scientifically impossible, they say, yeah, I know. But a, a science would tell you what is naturally possible. But by definition, miracles themselves are not natural. They're supernatural. So science tells us how the natural world behaves. But if there's something supernatural that happens, some supernatural comes in and affects the system, that's when a miracle occurs. That's how we would define what a miracle is. Uh, C.S. Lewis wrote a, a great book called Miracles on this exact point, And he used an example that stuck with me for many years. He said, imagine you're playing billiards. Billiards is a a boring version of pool, I think. I don't know. I've never played it. Um, But you can imagine, you think back to your your freshman physics class, if you thought, okay, if I have a couple of billiard balls on the table and I know how much they weigh and I know what gravitational acceleration is and I know that I strike the ball with a certain force, I can predict exactly where the balls are going to move, right? You agree with this? This is a doable physics problem. And so so you say, science tells me what will occur. Here's my system. Here we go. I'm now going to do the experiment, and you strike the ball. And then, uh, then your friend reaches onto the table and grabs one of the balls and messes up your experiment. Now, have you disproven physics in doing it? You would say, no, I didn't disprove physics. What happened is I made all my predictions you know, according to my system, but then something outside my system reached in and messed with my experiment. Right? No physics disproven. That is effectively what a miracle is. Right? The supernatural from outside of the, of the natural world reaches in and perturbs the system. It doesn't mean the laws of physics are broken. It doesn't mean it's physically impossible. It means that something outside of the calculations reached in and affected the system. Once you think of it that way, then the idea that miracles are scientifically impossible, that whole objection starts to go away. You would effectively have to say, you would have to assume that there's no God and that he can't reach in and affect the system. Okay. So uh, now, now a more controversial question. Um, does science support belief in God? Um, it's common to say science can't prove God, and of course prove is a very messy word, and science deals with the natural world, so how could science prove God? This is a real minefield for people to make um, silly arguments. I'll give you a fun example of a silly argument. Um, uh, anybody know this? Uh, 
Y'all already know what I'm going to say, maybe. Uh, who, who's this gentleman on your right? Bill O'Reilly. Okay, so Bill O'Reilly had um, an atheist on his show, and uh, these cable shows exist so that people can argue with each other and, and, uh, and get ratings, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, they were arguing about um, the existence of God, and of all the arguments to make, Bill O'Reilly chose to argue um, based on the tides. He said the tides go in, the tides go out. The tides go in, the tides go out. You can't explain that. And, of course, all the nine-year-olds of the world are at their home watching on TV. It's the moon, you fool. We know what causes it. The moon, gravitational pull of the moon causes the tides. However, unfortunately, the atheist at the table with Bill O'Reilly also did not know this and, and just tried to parry the question. And so all the nine-year-olds at home are just smashing their face against their TV like, well, how do neither of you know this? And so then, um, anyway, and then someone confronted Bill O'Reilly, and he tried to somehow double down on it instead of saying he was wrong. It was a, a real mess. But it led to the creation of a series of, of memes, you know, thing, things like this. Uh, Bread goes in, toast comes out, you can't explain that. So, it just goes to show, there are lots of bad arguments you should try to make. You could try to say like, ah, this and this, you can't explain that, therefore it's God. Um, There are lots of poor ways to do that, okay? And those are usually poor attempts at trying to say, you can't explain that, therefore God. Um, And so instead of going that way, let's let's think of it a slightly different way. And I'd say what I'm about to say is kind of a a, uh, one of the, the founding principles of Ratio Christi, so to speak. Science can't prove God, but we can look to science uh, to potentially provide support for philosophical premises um, and philosophical arguments for God. And if you're wondering, like, what are you talking about? I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, this is a famous uh, uh, argument for the existence of God. This is called the Kalam cosmological argument. Um, this, I think this was actually originated in the Middle Ages uh, uh, by Muslim philosophers, and it's gotten picked up by Christians over the years. But here's the basic argument. Um, whatever begins to exist has a cause. That makes sense. Things can't create themselves, um, and, and they can't just pop into existence out of nothing. Uh, premise two, the universe began to exist. And given those two premises, um, then you would say, okay, therefore, the the universe has a cause. And whatever this cause is, it has to be external to the universe. It has to be necessary. I mean, you start adding those kind of qualifiers, you know, a necessary, self-existent cause outside the universe, and the G word starts to pop up into your mind pretty quick, right? So this is a primarily philosophical argument, right? This is a philosophical argument, no science required. However, you could bring science into the mix and say, actually, science kind of tells us that premise two is right. All the data we have seems to indicate that the universe began to exist at a particular point at some finite time in the past. In fact, when the concept of the Big Bang was first proposed, people were very resistant to it because they knew that it supported this premise. Okay? And so what's bizarre is in in recent years, a couple of uh, physicists have even tried to use science. They they recognize the force of this argument and have actually tried to argue with premise one. Okay, Uh, the most famous example being um, uh, this book, uh, Universe from Nothing by Lawrence Krauss. It came out not not too long ago. And it's this idea that like, okay, maybe the universe began to exist, but it popped into existence from nothing. Um, What's frustrating about this book is when you actually read what Krauss means, is whenever Krauss says the universe came from nothing, he always means not really nothing, a very small something. He would say um, empty space with an energy, uh, with an average energy of zero, but you can have fluctuations in energy, and you say, wait a minute, that's not what I mean by nothing. When I say nothing, I mean nothing. Right? Nothing doesn't have properties, it doesn't have energy, it doesn't have fluctuations, so that doesn't make any sense. And so this has led to a lot of people kind of griping at Krauss saying, your entire book, uh, the only reason anybody buys it is because you equivocate in the title on the word nothing. And so that's a bit frustrating. Um, similarly, uh, so, so that's the, the problem. When they say the universe can come from nothing, they always mean mm, a, a small something. Uh, similarly, uh, Stephen Hawking actually said, Similar kinds of things. Um, So this is the headline on CNN.com. God didn't create the universe. And and, uh, Hawking said, Because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing, why the universe exists, why we exist. It's not necessary to invoke God to light the blue torch paper and set the universe going. You see the mistake he's made. He starts off with gravity and you say, No, no gravity. You get nothing. You don't get to say, I have nothing, and I smuggle something in to be able to begin to create things. And so this equivocation on the word nothing on that first premise is a continued problem. 
Okay, and so you can see the force of that argument. There are a number of other arguments people can make uh, from a philosophical basis why you, you might believe that a God exists or even that the specific God revealed in the Bible exists. I'm not going to go through all of those right now. The more famous ones are the fine-tuning argument, which is a variation on the teleological argument and so on. I want to emphasize those are philosophical arguments, but science itself can speak to the likelihood of, of any individual premise in those arguments being true. So that's one way to think about it. Right? It's not that science proves God, but science gives us hints about whether the, uh, a particular premise in, argu- in an argument might be right. All right. The final thing I want to talk about is the concept of the scientific mind. And I'm going to share a little bit of my own, my own journey um, as, I, as I was an undergraduate and a graduate student. So um, I'm originally from Texas. I, did, I told you I did my undergraduate degree at Texas Tech. And then I went to grad school at MIT um, 2002 to 2003. And in early 2003, I had a little bit of an existential crisis. And I'll describe it to you because some of you may be going through something quite similar now. Um, I began to think, okay, <clears throat> what if the naturalists are right? If the naturalists are right, then what are the consequences of that belief? Um, one, of the, one of the consequences is after you die, you cease to exist, right? Your consciousness goes away, you cease to exist. And uh, another consequence is that um, there's no real purpose to the universe, right? Eventually the universe will experience heat death, and that'll be the end of that. And so everything that you've ever really valued uh, is ultimately going to come to nothing. And anything that we imbue with meaning, anything we imbue with purpose is really just something that we project onto the universe. It's not really there, so to speak. And uh, I think you'd admit that those are pretty pretty negative, pretty despairing kind of conclusions to come to. And so then I thought, uh, well, I don't like that. I don't like those despairing, angsty kind of conclusions. And then I thought, oh, no. I don't like those conclusions. That must mean that I believe in God, I believe in Christianity, because I don't want those negative conclusions to be true. It's wish fulfillment. And this really sent me into kind of a tailspin, and I went into to full-blown skepticism. I thought the conclusions of naturalism, that we have no purpose, that we are annihilated after we die, and everything that we value is ultimately going to come to nothing, those conclusions are so awful that we must trick ourselves into believing that something else must be true. This is a variation on skepticism. There, there have been books, entire books written about this, um, particularly about the fear of death, right? That humans will, will project psychologically to try to imagine that death is not actually going to happen or that, uh, that these, this consequence of, of eventual non-existence is going to, to is going, that we're going to avoid it somehow because the innate psychological desire to avoid it is so strong. And so I, I, I really struggled with this. I thought, crud, all of my beliefs are just wish fulfillment. I wish that I could survive my own death. But it's just wish fulfillment. And so I thought that was this innate motivation for believing in the supernatural, believing in an afterlife, and even believing in Christianity. Um, So the question is, how did I come out of this? Do you all feel the force of that difficulty? It's tough, right? It's basically saying, you have a bias to believe everything that you believed. So I came out of it uh, through several means. The, the first I'll give you is just, this is more personal. Um, springtime came, and um, I looked at, I started reading a lot of uh, Lord of the Rings and things like that. And, and this, this may not convince you, but it, it made a big impact on me. I started thinking, if naturalism is true, uh, the world would have a great, le- a great deal less beauty and creativity in it than it does. Um, I know that's not a philosophical argument, but it, it experientially hit me pretty hard. You know, I was reading Tolkien and thinking, this this product of a mind, this product of an author, is far more similar to the world than what I would expect from naturalism. Okay, so that made a big impact on me. But from a more theor- philosophical point of view, um, I began to think through this whole skepticism that I had began to to, to think through of, oh, you only believe that because blah. Um, that logic, oh, you only believe that because you want it to be true, um, is a pretty, uh, it, th- that is not much of an argument, right? It actually doesn't prove anything. It also doesn't really cr- require any work or any data. It's just explaining away someone's belief. It assumes the belief is false and then it explains where the false belief came from. But it never actually goes and proves that the belief itself is false. Uh, the other difficulty is skepticism itself Skepticism about, about why we believe what we believe, that's a universal asset. No matter what you believe, whether you believe that God exists or whether you don't, one can find reasons to explain, oh, you only believe that because you want to blah, 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 
right? There's always a way to explain away someone's beliefs as something they want to believe or it only came from their wishes, but that doesn't actually prove anything about what's true or what's not true. And that applies to you no matter what you believe. So this universal skepticism, um, it doesn't really require any work and it doesn't, it doesn't really um, differentiate one belief system from another very well. Okay? The other thing that really helped me come out of this is I started thinking about, about the mind and what do we believe about the mind. Um, I was beginning my, my career as a graduate student at that point and I started thinking in particular about what do we believe about our mind when we go and do science. <clears throat> to be a scientist, you have to make certain assumptions. Um, you have to assume that when you, you sense something that your sense perception is basically, basically reliable, that allows you to take data, make measurements. And you have to assume that the universe itself is understandable and orderly so that we can describe it using mathematics, so that we can describe it using our theories, and that it'll, it'll, behave, it'll, be, it'll behave the same tomorrow that it did today, right? That the universe is orderly and understandable. And finally, you have to believe that your own mind is reliable, that you can actually logically think, through, th think things through and use your mind to comprehend the way the universe works. You have to assume that. You don't get to prove that. You have to assume that to even get started doing science. And so then the question is, why do I get to make those assumptions? Why do I get to assume that and start being a scientist? If naturalism is true, um, some of these assumptions become a little bit problematic uh, because on naturalism, it's very difficult to say that you have a mind. You have a brain, but a mind, what is that? Isn't the mind just the brain and nothing more? And so when you have... I. I, I know right now all of you are listening to me and you are seeing me and hearing me from a subjective first-person perspective, right? You have your own private first-person perspective on what's going on. That subjective first-person first person conscious experience of existing, learning, listening, and existing as a self is just biochemistry, if naturalism is true. In some sense, there is no you. There's just a collection of atoms that's going through various kinds of biological reactions. So the idea of a mind, the idea of a subjective first-person conscious self, both of those are reducible merely to biochemistry and nothing more. This additionally brings on the idea that when you think through something logically, when you say, I believe this statement to be true because everything you just said, your reasoning and the belief that something is true can be reduced merely to a particular state of molecules, right? It's nothing more than that. It can all be reduced to biochemistry. And I can, you can tell that this consequence of naturalism is true because it's already making the headlines. Um, so this is a, uh, a headline from uh, time.com. The brain, the mystery of consciousness. You exist, right? Prove it. How 100 billion, uh, how 100 billion jabbering neurons create the knowledge or illusion that you are here. This is naturalism in action. This headline is telling even Rene Descartes you, you, you think, therefore you are? Eh, even that's an illusion, right? You're just a collection of neuro neurons and nothing more. So that's the difficulty. Another way you can see this is in the, the description of what human beings and their minds are. Um, this is a quote from Francis Crick. Um, he's famous for being one of the co-discoverers -discover of the double helix structure of DNA. And he says, Your joys and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are, in fact, no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. He says, that's all there is to you. However, I think you'd have to agree that if he is going to be consistent, it would be better to change the quote, right? No longer to him saying that about you, but him saying that about himself, right? My joys and my sorrows, my memories, my ambitions, my sense of personal identity and free will, my beliefs, this statement itself is nothing more than the result of a bunch of neurons and cells. Oh, wait, why am I listening to myself? That feeling, I, I distinctly remember in 2003 having that feeling of, if I'm just a bunch of neurons, why am I listening to myself? And that's really what Crick should do. He should be willing to turn that knife not just on others and say, you're reduced to neurons and cells, but I myself am reduced to just these neurons and biochemistry. Oh no, why am I listening to myself? And if you, if, you're, if you doubt me, if you doubt, like, this is not really an issue. Scientists don't actually worry about this problem, do they? So I'll give you a quote. With me, the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, which have been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone doubt in the conviction of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? Anybody want to guess where this quote comes from? comes from Darwin himself. 
my goal is not tonight to argue about evolution or argue with Darwin. I'm just saying the problem of do we have a reliable mind is a real problem, and it's been around for that long, back to the mid-1800s. If you reduce mind to pure biochemistry, then the, your assumption of cognitive reliability suddenly becomes up for grabs. Okay? So some of you may say, wait, 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 wait. You skipped right over something. <clears throat> Effectively, everything I've just told you is reductionist, saying, if naturalism is true, you and your mind and your beliefs and, and your, your thought process, everything is reducible down to biochemistry. However, many naturalists don't believe that. They say, well, I'm a naturalist, yes, but perhaps um, consciousness and rationality and mind, etc., maybe these things can't merely be reduced to biochemistry. Perhaps they're an emergent property where if you get all the, all the uh, pieces in place to create this neural network, then consciousness emerges and supervenes upon that natural system. Okay? That's a very common belief. It's called emergence. Um, I have no idea what this means. I don't think anybody does. These words like emerge, supervene, they may as well just say, I don't know it's magic because these words don't actually have any meaning and can't be studied scientifically. They can't be associated with molecules. There's, there's nothing more to it. And so um, if, if you hear people talk about emergence, um, frankly, I think that's a little bit of a punt. Um, and there's not, there's not a lot of, of, of work and, and, and uh, progress that's been made on this front. So, so in my mind, if, if you do go the reductionist route, you say, I'm going to say I'm a naturalist, I'm reducible purely to biochemistry, um, you start getting into all these problems. So this is a quote from the New York Times. Um, <clears throat> this person is uh, explaining religion. They would say, if you're religious, um, here's the reason you're religious. It has the hallmarks of an evolved behavior, meaning that it exists because it was favored by natural selection. It's universal because it was wired into our neural circuitry before the ancestral human population dispersed from its African homeland. So this person is saying, if you are religious, you didn't come to those beliefs because of some rational good reason. You came to those beliefs because it happened to evolve to be advantageous for you to have those beliefs, therefore you have them. Not rational, right? That's a real problem, right? Because you could turn that back on themselves. If someone says, you have religious beliefs because evolution predisposed, predisposed you to do so, then you could say, what about your statement? Did, it, did evolution predispose you to believe what you just said, independent of any rational reason? These belief systems that undermine cognitive reliability, it's like sitting on, the tr on a tree branch and sawing off the branch that you're sitting on. Do you see that? This is a real problem, okay? So here's a, kind of a big slide. Here's, my, here's my, part of the reason I'm not a naturalist, that, I, that I, I, I move instead toward theism, and in particular I'm a Christian. Um, I don't think naturalism works. Um, if you're a naturalist, you, you know, it's very hard. Number, I didn't talk about this, but it's very hard to make should statements. Science describes what is. It doesn't describe what should be. And so should statements, like ethical norms, ought statements, don't have a lot of meaning on naturalism other than just human convention. That's pretty hard to live with. Um, there's no actual meaning. Any meaning to life would just be something that we came up with. It wouldn't actually be there. Um, but losing cognitive reliability or doubting cognitive reliability could be a real problem. Um, if you're interested in, in learning more about this, Alvin Planting has written a book called Where the Conflict Really Lies that explores this in some detail. And uh, one that really seals the deal for me is this idea of first-person subjective experience. If someone tells you, like that Time Magazine headline, it says, you don't really exist. You don't really have a first-person subjective experience. It's just biochemistry. You know they're wrong. You know they're wrong more than you know anything because immediately you have an immediate experience of, of a subjective first-person conscious experience right now. And no argument can lead you to believe that that's not true because you experience it directly. And so any worldview that leads you down this path to think that, subject, that, that your subjective first-person experience doesn't exist has got to have some problems. Um, and if we undermine cognitive reliability, it may even undermine science itself. If, we, if our minds are not capable of actually putting together logical, rational, coherent thoughts and theories about the natural world, it really undermines our ability to do science other than just bland empiricism. Okay? So <clears throat> the scientific mind and these assumptions that we have to make really has, a, has a, a tough time under naturalism. I think you can probably argue, well, you know, since perception is reliable, biochemistry alone, evolution alone can account for that. But cognitive reliability? I don't know. You would have evolved to survive and reproduce, not be able to tell truth about the world. 
The other assumption that I kind of skipped over is this one about the universe being orderly and reliable. It's very hard to, to show why that should be true if naturalism is the case. Um, if you're interested in this further, there's a very famous essay, not from a Christian, I don't even think from a theist, but it's called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics. It was written in the early 60s by Eugene Wigner. And he basically said, isn't it weird that the universe, course, that the patterns of the universe correspond so nicely to these mathematical regularities? Now, the laws of mathematics have to be true, but the correspondence of the behavior of the universe to these mathematical regularities, we need that to be true to do science, but it's hard to say why you would assume at the the get-go why that has to be so. Uh, In contrast, um, for me as a Christian, um, I feel like these assumptions fit very nicely within a Christian worldview. Um, What kind of assumptions do I need to make in order to be a scientist? Um, I believe the sense perception is reliable, and I believe that the universe is understandable and orderly because God made the universe. And that same God who made the universe also made my mind. Not only that, as a Christian, I believe that God made my mind in such a way to understand the universe. And so when I do my job as a scientist and say, I'm going to use my mind, which God gave me, to look at the universe, understand how molecules interact with each other, understand the building blocks that God made the universe out of, I am, in a sense, glorifying God. I'm understanding the beauty and the wonder by which God made the universe. And that's something I feel like all of us as scientists are kind of drawn to, right? Um, And this idea goes back a long, long way. When you look at a lot of the early pioneers in science, you find that quite a few of them were theists, many of them Christians. And they made statements very similar to one I just did. Um, Some of the more beautiful ones come from Kepler. He says, these scientific laws are within the grasp of the human mind. God wanted us to recognize them by creating, creating us after his own image so that we could share in his own thoughts. So when you say, why did the scientific revolution happen? Why then? Why those people? This Christian worldview that said, God made my mind, God made the universe to be understandable so I could use my mind to understand it. That was a major part in their motivation um, of, of actually doing science and understanding these things. And so uh, from that perspective, science really does, I think, affect, uh, or sorry, my faith really does affect the way that I do science. Um, When we look out in the world, and I'll just show you a few pictures, and I want you to think about, um, for those of you who are scientists or are interested in science, about what are the emotions they evoke, right? So you see something like like a blue whale, right? That that evokes a certain sense of wonder. Um, When you learn about, uh, does anyone know what this little guy is? It's a little spider with a little diving bell. The spider lives his whole life carrying this little bubble around with him to carry his air. It's amazing. It's not enough just to say, I understand that. There's a sense of wonder and beauty that comes with seeing something like that. And you see the Matterhorn. Or you see these pictures that come to us um, from the surface of Mars. Or we, we, launch, we launch telescopes into space that can see the great red spot on Jupiter and see its moons. Um, this is a sillier example. This is a, uh, a frog being levitated by a magnet. <laughs> the physicist who did this won the Ig Nobel Prize in physics. Um, and then later they won the Nobel Prize in physics for discovering graphene. Isn't that cool? So they hold a very interesting distinction to be the only people to get both. Um, so when you see these things in science, these kind of things should evoke a sense of wonder and beauty. And if you come at it from a naturalist perspective, it's kind of hard to know what to do with that sense of wonder and beauty. But from a Christian perspective, it makes a lot of sense. And I personally find it really gratifying to feel that connection with the great scientists uh, of the past, like Kepler, who say, he, they say things like this, the chief aim of all investigations of the external world should be to discover the rational order and harmony which has been Im- imposed on it by God. I'll give you one more example just because it's so good. Um, Kepler says, the diversity of the phenomena of nature is so great and the treasures hidden in the heavens so rich, precisely in order that the human mind shall never be lacking in fresh nourishment. It's a long winded say, way of saying, God wanted you to not be bored, but instead to say, wow. A consistent diet of wow is why God made this kind of world and wants you to be scientists. Now, this is the point where I should say, and now I'll go change your major to chemical engineering, uh, but I guess I won't. So, um, Oh, thank you, chemical engineers in the, in the audience. So um, we're about the 45-minute mark, and so I'll go ahead and, and uh, step aside and let, let you all ask some questions. I, I would ask, if, if you're going to ask a question, ask a question. You know, like... It would be no bueno if we had another 45-minute soliloquy. One for me is plenty. So, thank you. All right, let's...
All right. Um, before we transition to questions, uh, I just want to walk you through the little feedback card that you found in your uh, chair. Um, I do apologize. I do not know how to order uh, things that are you can write on, so you'll notice that they're very glossy. Uh, this is just for us so that we un- uh, know where you're coming from, and we want to be able to put on good events. Uh, if you're having difficulty writing on the front, just write on the back. Uh, this is where you can put your email if you want more information or put comments. So if you want to tell us that we're a bunch of stupid fundies and that we suck, this is the place to do it. Uh, if you uh, have any suggestions for future uh, events as well, you can put that on there. Uh, the way we'll do questions is um, just raise your hand if you uh, have a comment. So uh, any volunteers? Yes, sir. Hi. <clears throat> I enjoy your lecture presentation. I'm actually an atheist and biologist. I disagree probably with most of the things you said, but uh, I like the fact that you uh, are open for the debate, which is very good. Uh, I have many comments, but I don't want to monopolize the Q&A session. So I will be just a uh, uh, couple of them. Uh, the main point that I don't understand in this kind of uh, point of view, which I've seen also last week in John Lennon's talk, I don't know if you have a chance to see it, is that um, I understand that science uh, cannot really finish explain the supernatural world. It doesn't. But the thing that uh, also I uh, it is true is that uh, religion cannot describe the natural world as well as science can. So I find it very difficult when there is an attempt to uh, fit in what is in the Bible and what is science. The scientists find Those are those are both great questions, great great comments. I'll, I'll, I'll try to quickly address the, the first point and then and try to get to the, the second. Um, I'm not sure what specific issues you are running into in terms of people trying to inject the Bible into science or, or, or whatever. But I, um, I guess I would just uh, beg your patience and say, don't judge a philosophy by its abuse. And when it comes to science, a lot of Christians have probably abused the topic. And so, um, if you find yourself annoyed, if you find yourself annoyed by Christians, I would just say. Be patient, you know. You, you wouldn't want atheism judged by its worst adherents. Neither would we want Christianity judged by its worst adherents. Um, and in, in terms of, like, uh, does the Bible fully explain all the natural disciplines, I would say that's not really the point of the Bible. The point of the Bible is to deal with the far more, um, the far more important problem, which is our relationship to God um, and how we're made right with God. Um, the Bible has a very specific purpose. It's not a science textbook. It's not primarily there to teach us you know, the principles of heat transfer and all these other things. It has a very clear purpose. Um, and so the fact that it doesn't deal with everything under the sun doesn't, doesn't seem to be a, a strike against it. In fact, I, I would encourage you to, to read through the Bible and, and see, see it for the depth and the beauty that it has. Um, I think even, even someone who doesn't come from my faith background, when they actually read the words of Jesus, um, you can't help but be uh, amazed at what a remarkable person he was and what remarkable ideas he had, um, if that makes sense. Okay, on the, the other point of, uh, effectively, I think what you just said is like, <clears throat> look, the brain is complex and uh, science ain't done yet, so let's, let's give science a chance to try to dig into these issues and figure out how the brain works. Um, I guess what I would say is, no matter what we find out, if we reduce ourselves and say, oh, we only 
think the following thoughts because uh, of genes or because of these external causes, not because of rational reasons, th that knife can be turned back on yourself. Like, there's no way around it. Um, I think naturalists at least have to give up that mode of attack. At the very least, they can't use modes of attack that undermine cognitive reliability because, by definition, they undermine themselves. So, so I, and most of the, the, the I, talk, I have a lot of friends who are atheists, and most of the, the atheists I talk to, they kind of agree on that point. They're saying, yeah, okay, I believe that uh, our beliefs, and et cetera, come from our genes, but that doesn't mean they're illogical or irrational. Um, and so you can't turn that knife on Christians, so you can't turn it back on yourself. So um, the other thing is <clears throat> appealing to future science. Like maybe in the future, science will discover something that can uh, perhaps suss out the, the, uh, the complex complexity of where consciousness comes from. Um, I think we can, we can um, pretty confidently say that when it comes to the subject of consciousness, it's never going to happen because consciousness by its nature is subjective. By its nature, it is subjective. It's not something that you can look at with a microscope. It's not something that you can, that you can um, address from the outside described in a third-person way. You can't uh, describe a first-person reality using third-person objective external science. And you may say, like, well, that's not fair. You can't expect third-person objective science to describe first-person reality. And my point is exactly. If naturalism were true and there's nothing but atoms, there should be no first-person realities. And yet every one of us experiences it right now. And no scientific discovery in the future is ever going to cross that bridge. It's not a crossable bridge. It's a philosophical problem, not a data problem. So, okay, that was fiery, but whatever. Sorry. I'm, 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 I'm with you, though. Anyway, like, I think these are exactly the discussions I'd like all of us here to continue to have. And uh, for so students who are thinking, like, I'd like to, to go into neurobiology. Like, that is, that is you probably agree, one of the more fascinating areas we can go into because the brain is so complex. And every year that goes by, it's not like we say, oh, we're getting closer to figuring out the answers. It's we realize, like, oh, crud, it's way more complex than we thought, and we have a long way to go. So I saw another. Yes, sir. Uh, graduate student, no yeah. My faith background sounds a lot like yours. Okay. Thank you very much. You Great bet. job. I was wondering, as a scientist right now, do you still think that the old school philosophical terms such as ends and natures of things, um, are those still valid and supportable by the scientific evidence? Uh, ends, like a telos, like a purpose? Right. Yeah, you mentioned the theological argument. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, um, <clears throat> purposes and, and, and whatnot are the product of minds, and so if you say that, it, it depends on what you mean. It probably depends on what, what science you mean. Um, the science of forensics certainly tries to use that kind of language, saying this person used that tool for the purpose of killing that person. But if you're talking about like physics, it's probably pretty hard because you're ultimately talking about particles. Um, like I said, this is probably a good place where we, where we can say, if you're making a teleological argument that there is some agent beyond the universe that had certain purposes, you're, you can't get all the way there with science. All you can do is form a philosophical argument, and science may speak to the truthfulness of some of those, those premises. Um, it may muddy the issue. It may muddy the line between philosophy and science a little too much to use that language. Um, that, that said, I think the various fine-tuning arguments, the teleological arguments for the existence of God are legitimate, and science has something to say about the premises in those arguments. Is that fair enough? I'm trying to tread carefully to make sure I don't say the wrong thing. So. Push card. I got this. So the point of the law, uh, I'm pushing about the Kalam uh, hypothesis. Yep. So that's a, that's a comment. Oh, sorry. Let me go to the mic. <clears throat> let me go back to the slide so we make sure that we get it right. Da, 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 da. Here, I'm going to exit out. Don't you hate when you see, like, the muddy background of the PowerPoint? Yuck. Blah, 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 blah. Let's go back. There it is. Okay. So let's make sure that we get the, get the gist of it. <clears throat> so premise one doesn't say everything has a cause. It says whatever begins to exist has a cause. Um, and so, I mean, I think you'd agree that either we have an infinite, infinite regress of causes going backward into the past, or there's something back there that's uncaused. I mean, I, those are the only two options I can think of. Or there was absolutely nothing, and then out of nothing pops something. And so from a Christian point of view, we say there is something back there that's uncaused, um, that, that is not contingent, that's necessary. 
And if you don't, if some of you are like, yeah, but time is like weird, and I saw that Interstellar movie, and oh, I, anyway, if, if, if the whole time part bugs you, I guess it's also maybe helpful to think in terms of contingency and necessity, right? If I see, I look at Andrew here. Andrew is contingent. He didn't have to exist. So he's contingent on something else, which is contingent on something else. Somewhere back there has got to be something that was necessary, uncaused. It had to exist. Does that make sense? Yeah, Luke, if I'm reading Hawking, Hawking correctly, he seemed, it didn't seem like he was saying there was something, and then boom. He seems to be committed to saying there was nothing, and then boom, but he recognizes the problem and tries to smuggle a little something into the nothing. Um, some people have tried to argue, and I, I would respect this, I would respect the argument that there is some aspect of the universe that was uncaused and eternal, and then it created something. Um, I, I would at least respect that, but that doesn't seem to be where most scientists go, and it certainly doesn't seem to be where, where, where Hawking was coming from. Um, but that's that's probably a different argument. That's not where most people are. Yes, sir. Um, going back to what you were saying, uh, the, uh, the uh, materialists claim that uh, our consciousness, our first person subjective view of the universe, is a uh, is an illusion. Mm-hmm. Well, how do they explain the illusion? I have no idea. That's why I'm not a naturalist. I'm not joking. Like it, this is the thing. I, like I said, I flirted with naturalism. I was a you know quasi half skeptic for you know three months or so in 2003, and this was one of the things that I was like, oh, I'm out. And now I'm good. You know, so, because I, I felt like there was no scientific data. There was no argument that, that can get around that particular problem. So, <clears throat> other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Religion. Yeah. And so, where do you fit people who are in the gray area that don't know what's out there and don't necessarily have a faith or not have a faith? Right. Yeah. I mean, I I think that's probably where a lot of college students are. Right. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a that's the kind of place a lot of people are in their college years. Um, a, a, a tremendous number of my friends are agnostic. I guess my my only word to the agnostics, and this is what I I, I tell my friends is. Um, it's okay that you don't know the answer and that you're still searching, but do search. Don't assume that the answer is unknowable. Um, a lot of agnostics are kind of like, well, who the heck knows? But no, but we can't agree, therefore it's probably not knowable. And that's a little bit of a punt. So I, what I'd like to see is more agnostics saying, I don't know, but I'm going to do the hard work and try to chase it down so that I do know. Yes, sir. <laughs> that's part of what made Socrates so wise. So yeah. I have a question going back to um, what you said, your like, personal development mm-hmm. stage when you, right before you read Tolkien. Um, what you were talking about uh, was you, you were addressing your personal biases about um, not wanting to narrow your mindset, or what did you say? Yeah, this this is a good question. Let me let me quickly say, by the way, Socrates wouldn't say he was a total agnostic. There are certain things like the existence of moral ideals that Socrates would say we freaking know them for sure. The ideals of math, we know them for sure. So there's some things we know for sure. And I mean, I think you are right though that like the person who thinks they know and doesn't know that's a bad spot to be in. So it's it is worthwhile to check yourself and doubt yourself and kind of see why do you believe what you believe. That is, in some sense, what I was trying to do in 03. Basically, what I was recognized, what, what I was trying to recognize, is because I was raised in a, in a Christian household, I had a bias toward believing that it was true, and because I didn't want the universe to be without meaning, I had a bias against naturalism. And so I thought, crud, do I only believe in Christianity because I have these biases? The truth is that we all have biases, and you can't explain away someone's belief solely. On the, on the basis of those biases. You actually have to provide an argument at some point. So, so I guess what I would say for you, if you meet a friend and let's say, just for the sake of, of argument, your friend is a Muslim and they grew up Muslim, their parents were Muslim, it would, it would be probably disingenuous and unkind to say, you're only a Muslim because you, you grew up as a Muslim. That kind of minimizes your friend and says, oh, you only believe this because blah. That doesn't actually mean that it's false. 
or that they don't have good reasons for believing it. We need to give each other more respect than that. Yeah. Yes, sir. So science tends to, I would say you can argue constantly, that you have data and you say, well, I know that there will be advances, but this is currently the best data I have. Mm -hmm. So I have to roll with it and, and take a gamble and hope that you know you have probability and say that you know it, my result will hopefully fall within this parameter. So from that perspective, would you say that um, from a scientific perspective, approaching religion with this sort of Pascal's wager approach? Oh, this is a... If I'm a betting man... <clears throat> this is a great question. And this, re this relates to your question about agnosticism. Because the agnostic says, like, I only say I believe something once I get up to, like, 90% or something. And right now I'm at, like, 55%, so I don't really know. And I'm not going to pretend that I'm at 100, because that would be disingenuous. Um, and so... the. The trouble with religion in this regard is that um, it has stakes, you know, and uh, there's, the, you know, this is the way it is, that, that there's, a, there's a moral demand on us, a demand, to, be, a demand to, be, to believe and to live in a certain way, and when you make that commitment, you are effectively betting, right? So when a Christian says, I'm a Christian, I'm committing myself this way, you're, affecting, you're effectively betting your life. And the Bible actually says, there's one place where Paul says, if Jesus is not raised, then we are of all men most to be pitied, basically because we've bet our lives on something that was wrong. Um, I guess the argument I would make, and this is probably what Pascal would say. Don't misunderstand Pascal, by the way. Pascal, the point he was trying to make is that everybody bets. It may be tempting to think, well, only the religious people really bet their life, but the truth is everybody bets their life, even the agnostic. And so there are stakes. We can't just say, like, ah, well, whatever, who knows? Because you can choose not to bet on the Super Bowl. You can choose not to bet on Saturday's game. But in terms of these ultimate purposes, how am I going to live? What is the purpose of life? Everybody bets. And <clears throat> some people have misunderstood Pascal, by the way, to say, uh, well, if Christianity is true and you bet against it, then you're in real trouble, so you, therefore you should go with Christianity. You, <clears throat> I don't think that's what he meant, because if you did that, you would create some weird arms race as to who has the religion with the worst, the, the most horrible hell, and that's the one you should go with, you know, <laughs> on a betting perspective. That's not what Pascal meant. <clears throat> Basically, Pascal had... Uh, had, had disdain for people who were like, it's not worth my time to figure it out. I have better things to do. He said, everybody bets, and you're betting, so put the time into it, put the thought into it. Um, speaking of which, so all that for, from Pascal comes from his collection of thoughts called the Pensée. Um, I would encourage every college student to read it. It's, a, it's a kind of scattered thoughts. They collected it after he died. There's something very powerful about reading a figure from the past, so someone who seems like, oh, I read about Blaise Pascal on Wikipedia. Then you read him and you think, this person could be my friend. This person could be my classmate. He's asking himself the same kind of questions I ask my, myself. Um, that was certainly my experience reading Pascal and this idea that this person from the past has struggled through the same questions that I have and is kind of a co-seeker for truth along with me. Um, there's something very powerful about that. Um, that's certainly true for those of us who are scientists and engineers. We know that we're not that smart and that we didn't discover all this stuff on our own. We build on the foundations of people like Pascal who came before us. And so I think there's something to be said for not just dialing into what is my current cultural mood, what do most of my friends think, but what do the great thinkers of the past think. That's why you know the, I bring up someone like Kepler or Pascal because their input can help get us out of our own little 2016 America bubble. You see what I'm saying? That's really well, and that's something that's well worth your time. Okay, it is 9.33, and I think we have to be out of here by 9.40. Otherwise, what happens? Like the walls close in or something? And yeah, yeah. Something what, like what, there, there's one more question. Can we go fast? This is real quick. Go for it. Pascal's thoughts, what is, what's it called again? Pensee. It's like P-E-N-S-E-E-S. -E -E I don't speak enough French to make sure I did it correctly. But if you go to Paris, I demand that you go to his tomb and give him, you know, a shout out, you know. <laughs> yeah. Also, you have units of pressure named after you. I mean, what could be what could be better than that? So, yeah. All right. With that, I really will close. And I appreciate y'all.